My name is Ned Loprin. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators. We represent all the state directors of juvenile corrections around the country and some of the larger counties uh, as well, such as uh, New York or Philadelphia. Um, and with me is Kevin O'Coin, who is the Deputy Director of the Rhode Island Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And, who, and joining us later, she's coming from an event, is uh, Melody Haynes, who is the Acting Administrator at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So um, when Melody gets here, she'll slip in and uh, speak. Melody uh, wants to uh, greet all of you and uh, talk to you about uh, some of the initiatives that she's uh, developing at uh, OJJDP. And um, so what, what I wanted to do is to uh, talk to you a little bit about the work that CJCA has been doing over the last um, four years now on measuring recidivism. Um, there are some truisms about measurement that I just wanted to talk to you about first before we get into what we've done at CJCA. Um, we, I think you all know we live in a culture that can't get enough of numbers. Uh, how many presidential polls have you seen in the last two years? Um, my heart goes up and down as the Dow Jones goes up and down uh, every day. Um, but there's, a vain, there's an ancient and dominant belief of Western culture that is that numbers are what is real. If you can number it, you can make it real. We depend on numbers to know virtually everything. We determine our health by numbers. What's our calorie count? How many grams should I eat? What's my cholesterol count? We assess one another with numbers. And of course, we judge kids in our systems with numbers. What is his IQ or, his, or her reading level? Or what's their risk score? So we measure what's important to us. I try to measure my checking balance, so I, checking account balance, so I don't have the painful discovery of a very serious um, overdraft fee if I bounce a check. Um, as the head of the, of the uh, Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, I measure the tenure of the state directors of juvenile corrections because, and there is a vi very high turnover of the state directors of juvenile corrections. Um, since we founded our organization in 1994, there are 52 state or District of Columbia and Puerto Rico being the 52 members. And those, posi those 52 positions have had 347 incumbents since 1994. That's a measure that I really take seriously because that speaks to the stability of my organization. If there's a high turnover, that means I and my staff have to reorient or have to orient the new director who comes into the state and really enroll that person if we're gonna be an effective, um, effective organization. So we measure what's important to us. I got ahead of myself. Um, we measure those things that are important in, in addition to measuring what's important to us, not all things are, that are measured are important. Uh, that's Albert Einstein's um, dictum. When I was uh, a, um, an expert witness in a case in, in a state, um, I, it, it was a, a case of negligence against the, uh, the staff, and so I decided to look at the logbooks. And I found by reading the logbooks that the staff were making entries from shift to shift to shift. And they were putting pretty much the same thing from shift to shift to shift. And I realized that that probably really wasn't um, really important information and, and didn't really mean a lot to me. Einstein also said that we measure, that not everything that um, is important can be measured. And I'm sure you can think of things that support this thesis. So we probably measure things that we regard as important that are not, and we may lose sight of things that are important because we don't measure them. So let's not assume that measuring and defining recidivism is important. Let's start by asking why would we, why would we even want to consider measuring recidivism? What purposes do our recidivism, recidivism data serve? So what makes the measurement of recidivism important? Russ Acoff, a former professor at the Wharton School said, plan or be planned for. 
I remember when I was commissioner in the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, every year the judges used to file a bill to get direct sentencing authority over my system, the Department of Youth Services. We had all sentencing authority once the youth was committed. So I used to arm myself and go up to the legislature in a very diplomatic and polite way, try to show that if you give 64 different counties, um, so let's say 300 judges, dispositional authority over the youth, my system would collapse <laughs> with, because you would have disparate sentencing all over the place. If I wasn't armed with data that showed that that would be a very regressive measure that I would have been planned for. And so that's my example. We need to be armed with data or else we're going to be planned for. So actions will be taken. There is a need for action to be taken. Most, of, if not all of us, are advocates for evidence-based programs and practices. Our desire is to adapt and implement programs that have been tested elsewhere in the short run. This may mean increasing your operational budget. It may also mean deleting some programs that are not effective. Our knowledge is limited. We know very little about the complex interaction among the forces that influence success, and most of the evidence we have pertains to the intervention designs constructed by researchers and which have been implemented under their watchful eyes. We simply have little knowledge about the effectiveness of most programs operating in the real world of juvenile corrections. We need to know, moreover, it would be disastrous if we stopped developing our most successful programs. None of them have reached some miraculous state of perfection. And then in terms of development, rehabilitation is, is not merely a goal, it is a belief system. We believe that it is possible to build systems of intervention that enhance the quality of life for the kids in our care while reducing the harm they inflict on the communities when they go back. So we ground our search for effective programs and practices in that belief. For example, if we even found out that the restraint chair was an effective tool for reducing recidivism, we probably wouldn't choose it because it's an intervention that is contrary to our principles. But because there are those who advocate punitive practices, we all need to be partners in the search for positive, effective, and effective intervention approaches. The word accountability connotes measurement. By measuring a program, we are accepting the claim that our program should affect that outcome we choose and to measure the outcomes or our work in order to give credibility to our claims about affecting this, about the impact of certain policies and programs on the successes or failures experienced by program clients. In fact, we believe that everyone spending our tax dollars should be accountable for the objectives attached to those expenditures. We need to communicate. We need to have valid comparisons. We can't, we we can't measure a group of rural youths, the, the recidivism rate for a group of rural youths with a group of kids from say, inner city LA. And there are multiple uses of data, and that's why it's so important that we have accurate data, and that we have data that is consistent from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And data has, has we, we are being forced constantly to justify the dollars that we spend in juvenile corrections. So there are gonna be future uses of data. So what I'd like to do is to talk to you today about the story. Um, the story of CJCA finally, reali not finally, but realizing that, that the data we were receiving from the states on recidivism was all over the place. Um, because agencies are judged successful or not based on the rates indicating to what extent kids commit crime after services. Program impact evaluations include recidivism. Currently, it's kind of a fruit salad of comparison, states and rates, so therefore we began to collect the data in our recidivism survey in the yearbook, in, in our annual yearbook in 2004. And we developed a consensus um, in CJCA and we've, of what we ought to measure um, in recidivism. And uh, we published a white paper called Measuring and Defining Recidivism um, in 2009. And that has really guided our work in the last several years. Um, there's a historic, it's a historic measure that was carried over from adult correction practices and approaches to juvenile justice. But it's a measure of failure. What doesn't, uh, what doesn't work 
rather than a measure of success. So OJGDP sponsored national meetings with all the state directors, and we consulted with all the data and recidivism experts. And two approaches were developed. Recidivism, obviously the, the negative failure measures, and positive youth outcomes, uh, linkages, skills, and competencies. And I'd like to talk about both today. Uh, this is the uh, publication, Measuring and Defining Re Recidivism, and articles on it have been published in the ACA Journal and also in, juvenile, in the uh, OJJDP First Juvenile Justice uh, Journal um, in the fall of 2011. So why should we standardize? Well, for, first of all, different measures produce different rates. So arrest, adjudication, placement. So the white paper has the introduction, the need for standardization, current practices, and recommendations for standardization and the use of recidivism measures. The goal of, measure, of the measurement is to reduce reoffending, to increase support for evidence-based uh, effective programs, and to enhance um, programs, uh, continuous quality improvement. So why do we standardize? Well, rearrest. This, these are the uh, this is the data from the Virginia Department of Youth Services. Rearrest, we have 55 percent in rearrest. Referral to court at 45 percent. Reconviction 33 percent. Reincarceration 25 percent. So you you really have to differentiate between those four events. Why standardize? Different kids produce different rates. This is the main youth um, one-year recidivism rate for the 2008 cohort. The low-risk youths had a 14.1% recidivism, the moderate 26, and the high-risk 32%. So the core recommendations that came out of the work that CJCA has done and that are published in the, in the white paper are that states need to specify the population that's represented. The age, gender, race, first-time offender, secure care program, special needs, mental health, offense type, risk score. We, we also recommend that they always include a conviction and an adjudication and adult convictions too. We, we, we recommend that the states have multiple measures, not to just go on arrest, not to just go on reconviction, not to just go on recommitment. We specify the length of follow-up to be about two years, the optimum follow-up about two years. Um, some states follow kids for six months, 18 months, two years, and three years. Um, we've, we recommend that they do all, all uh, four of those, but, but we're most interested in states following youth for at least two years. And to also uh, measure status offenses and technical violations separately from new delinquent criminal offenses. And the reason we recommend that is that if you do a risk assessment instrument, risk assessment instruments, as we all know, are um, try to measure what future offending is going to be like. And the offending is based on the criminal law in that particular jurisdiction. So therefore, if you mix the, uh, the uh, technical violations with the, with the uh, criminal violations, you're really not going to get an accurate, accurate picture of your recidivism in that particular state. And so uh, we're, we're fairly, st fairly strong on that particular recommendation. So our recommendations for standardizing recidivism measurement is to specify the population demographics. I talked about the age, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, placement in a secure care uh, community without supervision. The offense type, property, person, weapons, misdemeanors. And the risk items, age at uh, first adjudication, number of prior offenses, substance abuse, mental health. Um, the data include a measure of the adjudication or conviction. As I said, use more than one measure to increase opportunities uh, for comparison. And to separate categories of, of cases, recommitment based on a new offense, released home, released on uh, probation. And then the tracking period, as I said, at least 24 months. And record the dates of adjudication, conviction, release to the community, discharge from court, and the date of the offense. So what we're trying to recommend to the states, we know that not everyone is going to be able to comply um, with all of these recommendations uh, at once. And so we're actually um, recommending that there be kind of three levels of compliance with the, with the recidivism measures. So each level is going to build on the previous level by adding additional recidivism event types. 
offense characteristics and individual characteristics according to the multiple population types. So it's hard for you to read this, but so I'll just read it. Level one is, this would be the population to be measured would be the youths released from juvenile agencies, the juvenile agency's custody. The other would be the uh, individual characteristics would be just the age and the sex. The recidivism event would be the adjudications and convictions. And the tracking period would be 24 months from the date of release to the community. For level two, the, the population would be the youths released from the juvenile agency's custody, the youths committed directly to probation or community-based programs. The characteristics would be age, sex, committing offense, race, and ethnicity. Recidivism event would be the adjudications and convictions, the filing of charges and arrest. And the tracking period would be 24 months. And then level three would be youths released from juvenile agen the juvenile agency's custody, youths committed directly to, to the probation or community-based programs, and the added one would be youths released from custody who have, been, who have completed aftercare and parole. The individual age characteristics would add risk level, special needs, and placement type to the other characteristics. The, re the recidivism event would add commitment to juvenile or adult facility, post-adjudication conviction, commitment to juvenile or adult facility due to a technical violation. So you'd measure them separately, but criminal or uh, the commitment due to juvenile or adult uh, based on a technical violation or on a criminal event. And again, the tracking period is 24 months. We know that not every state has the resources to meet all three levels, and so therefore we're working with our states, and we're gonna have a pilot project with our states to see who, and some of our states already are trying to meet these three levels of um, reporting recidivism. So I'd like to just talk to you about one state and um, then to talk a little bit about the, um, the positive side of, of um, measurement, which is the positive youth outcomes. So uh, CJCA has been guiding Maine's and also Rhode Island's recidivism research on how they can use the data to inform policy and practice. Um, it began um, in Maine in 1998 with those cohorts, and the one measure was youth who were adjudicated uh, the very first time. Um, they, they, um, the change in first adjudicated uh, cohort to include only those youth placed under DJS supervision moved towards measuring division impact. Um, the multiple measures are the youth, youth who first adjudicated and who were first adjudicated and placed under supervision, youth who were discharged from supervision, youth who are released from youth development centers, and the youth who are di diverted to be released in 2012. And um, I won't read these, but that's, this is just what I went through. So the first adjudicated youth, the second, those under supervision, the discharge from supervision, released from commitment, and those youth who are diverted. So their current findings show that what we said before, that high-risk youth come back at higher rates. So this is, uh, is uh, the one-year recidivism by the uh, YLS CMI level, risk level. Um, the low-risk youth, you can see the, the blue is the youth entering supervision, and the green is the youth discharged from supervision. So you can, you can see that the high-risk youth have a greater offending uh, potential than the, uh, than the low risk youth. Among the youth entering supervision, the high risk uh, youth came back more quickly. And this may be common sense to you, but you can't go on anecdotal information. You really have to go on what you're measuring. And so we see the, the moderate youth came back um, in seven months, the moderate 5.4, the high 4.3. There are some youths who they did, just didn't do a, a good job in getting the assessments, so they, um, the, um, there was no assessment for them, so they, they were comparable to the moderate youth. And this is the, um, the tracking of it, the three-year recidivism rate, youth adjudicated for the first time, cohort, 39% in the breakdown is uh, the youth's um, the uh, one, two, uh, and three years. The, youth, the adult um, convictions are the, the um, dark line in the middle, 30%, and the juvenile uh, adjudica re-adjudications are 9%. And this is the current um, findings 
um, of youth discharge from supervision, the 2006 and 2007 cohorts, and again, the total was 36%, and the juvenile um, rate was, um, for the three years, uh, is the green line, and the adult is the, um, I, I'm sorry, the adult is the green line, and the juvenile is the blue line. And Maine's data sources are their, um, their, core informa their uh, chorus information and Department of Corrections information. Their tracking period was three years uh, of the decision point, adjudication, discharge, release from com commitment, and, and uh, diversion. The recidivism event was a re-adjudication uh, for juvenile or a reconviction uh, for an adult. Uh, the time frame was the date of adjudication to the date of reoffense. Uh, the population characteristics, gender, age, race, uh, county. Uh, the offense characteristics were the number, most serious class, most serious type at first and second adjudication. The risk level uh, were the uh, youth level of service and case management inventory scores, and they had three years of uh, data. Maine has found out that the youth in transition are most at risk to recidivate. To recidivate. So the blue is the discharged youth, and the green is the supervised youth. And I think what's interesting here is that their rates are pretty similar. And then the youth who recidivate more are more likely to do so in the first few months. And again, common, I think it's common um, belief, but again, this is the data that supports Maine's findings. So we see in the first uh, three months, the high rate going all the way down to the, um, the uh, 34 to 36 months. So Maine and our other jurisdictions are trying to use recidivism findings to inform policy. The finding that high-risk youth recidivate at higher rates and more quickly. The policy implication is that they need to complete that, um, those instruments more quickly to identify the high-risk youth and ensure that the appropriate interventions are in place. And the finding also is that youth who are not assessed come back as quickly as the moderate-risk uh, youth. The implication is to improve the rates to correctly identify youth risk level and to inform case management. So the key findings for Maine is that even after three years, most of the cohort, 61% did not recidivate. So I think that would give uh, answer to that question. And the youth who recidivated tended to do so quickly with the highest number of youth recidivating within the first three months compared to any other time. So the lessons that have been learned that are guiding our work in recidivism are that we can standardize data definitions, and systematic measurement. We can compare practices and programs using common data and definitions. Data can serve as a catalyst for change. Continuous reporting and analysis of information can sustain improvements through changes in leadership and funding cycles. Increasing the ability of the juvenile justice agencies to communicate clearly about recidivism will require the use of a common language, common definitions, and systematic measurement. Standardization of definitions and measures of recidivism, it'll increase our capacity to learn about effective programs and practices. It'll allow agencies to implement programs and allocate resources in a cost-effective manner. And it will help protect the public from future criminal acts to build support for collaborative problem solving through information sharing and strategic planning. So our, we have a shared mission, engagement, and common background. It's, we want to come together with a purpose uh, the engagement uh, in formal and informal learning, doing and working together towards change. Uh, the background coming from similar places the juvenile justice system experiences to share and learn from. And so what Kevin is going to talk about is what we uh, are the, the next steps that we have uh, begun to implement. One is uh, we drafted a survey and sent it to all the states, and Kevin is going to talk about the results of that survey. Uh, we're exploring what data states have in regards to the C, the uh, CJCA measures and how long they've been collecting that information. Uh, we're going to ascertain the, fac the facilitating factors and challenges to collecting this data. And for example, can, st uh, can uh, states track juveniles easily into the adult system? Some can, some can't. And determine whether states would have an interest in participating in a multi-state recidivism study using the standard, standardized definitions. And to determine data variables for multi-state analysis. One of the reasons why this is so important, that if you in your own state went to your legislature and went to your judiciary and asked them about measurement in the juvenile system, they would, many of them would say, we don't know. We, 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 uh, and whatever percentage gets thrown out by, by that 
jurisdiction, we don't know if it's accurate. And that's what we confronted when we, when we did the survey for our yearbook. And we saw that states were measuring it so differently. Their definitions were different, the length of time that they were measuring. Some counted arrest, so, as I showed. Some counted reconviction. Some counted recommitment into a, a juvenile facility, but not into adult facility. So you have one state saying, we have an 8% recidivism rate. Or another state saying, or someone saying about another state, they have a 95% recidivism rate. So that's why we're, we're really moving toward a, a common measurement. The, when we began to have our debate about uh, measuring recidivism, um, a number of the members said, you know, this is our own fault. <laughs> we're always measuring our failures. We're never ma measuring our success stories. And so we formed a committee. This goes back now three years. We had a, re a recidivism committee that produced the white paper and these common definitions of, uh, for measurement. But then we decided to have a, a, a positive youth outcome committee. It meets monthly. In fact, I staff it. And I'll be on it tomorrow afternoon from the airport. We uh, have our call uh, tomorrow. Um, it's a, a way of thinking about youth. Um, it suggests attending to the potential protective factors and working to build on those factors. It's understanding the connection between normal adolescent behavior and delinquent behavior that can inform intervention. Welcome. <laughs> no, don't worry. Welcome, Melody. Um, treating the symptom of delinquency is different than treating the causes of delinquency. And positive youth development assumes that strengths, a strengths-based approach fosters self-esteem and other protective factors in adolescents. Generally, these outcomes are the ones that indicate the presence of these protective factors, competencies, or health. Uh, rooted in the philosophy, it's a way of thinking about the development of adolescence and the factors that facilitate a, a successful transition from adolescence into adulthood. Uh, the goals of measuring PYO, it's to facilitate the creation of the positive youth development perspective within juvenile correctional programs, to develop a better understanding of how positive youth development contributes to the desistance from crime and delinquent behavior. And it's a shift in the stakeholder views and expectations of what the expected uh, program, the effective programs uh, can produce. And so we collect, again, in our annual yearbook, we collect the data on positive youth outcomes. And our last yearbook, or the one that's actually going to be published this year for 2011, shows that 37 states are measuring increased educational scores, 34 are measuring high school graduation rates, 29 are tracking school attendance after the youth leaves, 28 states track acquisition of vocational skills, and 26 states track improved behavior via a point or level system. While promising, there may be a conceptual and, pra and practical gap for many jurisdictions around positive youth development. So the future state of outcome measurement, we want to identify a shared language and definitions of the concepts of positive youth development. We want to develop an inventory of validated and reliable assessment tools for measuring positive youth outcomes. And we want to analyze and propose for implementation assessments suitable for tracking outcomes in various types of uh, juvenile correctional programs. So the three areas of the positive youth outcome focus are obviously healthy youth, education, and family connectedness. And we're going to select five states to be, to be pilots for enhancing the capacity for PYO measurement in these areas. And that's the organization that's doing all this. So I'd like to turn this over now to uh, Kevin Alcoin, who's going to talk about this most re the results of the most recent recidivism um, uh, survey that we conducted among our members. The results literally came in last week, so this is hot off the uh, computer. Good afternoon. Uh, it's always wonderful to follow Ned. Uh, I, as Ned indicated, I'm the Deputy Director of the Rhode Island Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Uh, we are a child welfare agency, Children's Behavioral Health, as well as Juvenile Justice. Uh, our agency is one of the members of the CJCA, and for the last uh, year and a half, uh, I've been the chair of the CJCA Recidivism Committee. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, to have the benefit of the work that was done uh, by my predecessor and the chair of that committee, and the uh, hard work of all the members coming up with the standards that Ned just worked, uh, just uh, went through for you. Uh, one thing I could tell you is, even with those standards, 
the committee continues to uh, be challenged in trying to put the information, pull the information together and in a way that makes sense and in a way to try to inventory what is out there uh, in the, uh, uh, amongst the various states. One of the things that we struggled with in uh, coming up with the survey is coming up with a very precise uh, instrument, a survey instrument that would try to identify, and you'll see in a moment, uh, the results, try to identify uh, exactly what parameters uh, states are currently at in terms of uh, measuring outcomes, uh, but more particularly measuring recidivism. Uh, before I go into our results, just by a show of hands, I'm assuming most folks in this room are, are involved with juvenile justice agencies. Uh, with that assumption, uh, how many uh, folks do track recidivism? How many track outcomes separate from recidivism? Okay. Uh, our survey actually uh, found that uh, there is a majority of the states that responded to the survey uh, are tracking the uh, recidivism and a couple of the states, three of them, uh, were actually tracking uh, outcomes and not recidivism. All right, so the survey itself, uh, we published it, uh, as Ned said, it's hot off the press. Uh, we published it, uh, actually we had two takes at it. Uh, the most recent one we did in uh, mid-April. Uh, we, the purpose of it was to inventory all of the uh, member states as well as Washington DC and Puerto Rico uh, to determine what inventory of recidivism measures exist uh, throughout the various states. Uh, our queries that we put out there uh, looked at, first of all, who was tracking what, what were the measures, what were the recidivism measures based on, how is that data um, being uh, maintained, uh, how is it being utilized, the time frames, uh, we tried to look at the white paper and take that information and, as I said, get very precise in terms of trying to track and inventory what's out there. Uh, the circulation, I already mentioned, uh, all the states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico. And uh, as of today, I'm pleased to report that we've had 40 responses of the 52 member jurisdictions. Uh, it is our goal to uh, contact the remaining 12 jurisdictions. We think a survey like this is as valuable as the response we received. Uh, so we need, to, we're going to really strive to get uh, full 100% uh, participation in the survey. Uh, so now some of the results. Uh, in terms of the jurisdictions that responded, uh, 37 of the 40 uh, indicated that they collect data on youth placed in secure juvenile correctional facilities and or youth on residential and non-residential community supervision. Okay, now that was a very broad question. Then we asked a very particular question uh, of those jurisdictions that do uh, collect uh, and track outcome data, how many actually uh, collect and track presently recidivism, recidivism data? And what we, uh, the response we received to date is 35 uh, jurisdictions currently collect recidivism data, which is actually uh, consistent with what we assume would be the uh, premise. Now, the fact that uh, folks track recidivism data uh, doesn't necessarily mean we all do it the same way. Uh, again, the purpose of the white paper was to try to standardize the measurements. Obviously, there are various measures that can be utilized to track recidivism. And by publishing the white paper, CJCA in no way was uh, suggesting that we don't look at other measurements. But what we're trying to do is have at least a standardization of measure uh, for recidivism that we can all utilize. And then if we're going to track other measures, whether it be rearrest, whether it be tracking for technical violations, that should be separate from uh, the standardized measures that were adopted in the white paper. Well, when we did the inventory, uh, we're still challenged in this regard. There are multiple uh, measures out there that the jurisdictions are using. Uh, 10 of the 35 jurisdictions that are measuring recidivism track arrests. Okay, 23 out of 35 jurisdictions are measuring the recidivism by adjudication and or conviction. Now, uh, Ned 
had it in his presentation. One important uh, point here is that in the white paper, uh, the uh, adjudication or re-adjudication and conviction uh, should be on offenses that would otherwise constitute a crime. Uh, so on a juvenile matter, you're talking about uh, offenses that would either be a felony misdemeanor if committed by an adult. They should not be technical violations. Uh, that would definitely skew the data and uh, would actually uh, uh, distort uh, the uh, measure uh, in and of itself. We are recommending that that be tracked. Technical violations is an outcome that should be tracked, but that should be tracked separately from the uh, adjudication and conviction uh, for criminal offenses. 23 out of the 35 jurisdictions measure recidivism by commitment to a juvenile facility. Um, again, this, is good, this just is hot off the press, so the committee has to analyze this. Uh, I'm not certain if that 23 is the same 23 that is tracking the adjudication and conviction. I sense that it may be. Uh, but if not, that is yet another vary, uh, variance in terms of uh, the measures. So those jurisdictions are looking at only the youth who are coming back to their secure facility, whereas the other jurisdictions are looking at offenses uh, uh, resulting in a re-adjudication or conviction, even if it didn't mean they came back to the facility. You can only um, imagine the variance in terms of what that data will look like with those uh, different uh, measures. Uh, the last one is 20 out of the 35 jurisdictions measure recidivism by commitment to an adult facility. Uh, so not only are they measuring by uh, commitment to the juvenile facility, they're also looking at uh, youth who are coming into the adult uh, facility. Uh, and if anyone has questions as we go through this, uh, it's just uh, the disclaimer on this is this is very fresh. We're still processing it, uh, but any questions are welcome. All right, uh, the parameters. Uh, one of the things we asked in the white paper was, and Ned I had made reference to it, is that at a minimum, uh, the recidivism should be tracked for uh, 24 months. Uh, the gold standard uh, we would recommend would actually be up to 36 months, but the minimum baseline should be 24. Uh, we were actually, uh, when we looked at the parameters, uh, 28 of the 35 jurisdictions do track recidivism for specific time periods. And the good news is 30 of the 35, uh, actually, I want to go over this. I may have skipped one. Well, when we get to the slide, it's most of the jurisdictions uh, that uh, respond to the survey do track um, uh, do track the time frame up to 36 months. Uh, we were looking at exit and entry cohorts. As I said, in terms of the standard, uh, many facility, when does, when does the time frame begin? Does it begin when the youth leaves the facility? Does it begin when the youth is sentenced? Does it begin when a youth is placed on community, uh, community supervision? Uh, well, the results here uh, actually show that most of the jurisdictions, 30 out of 35, are tracking from the point of exit from the secure facility. That is clearly uh, the optimal standard. Uh, in terms of community-based supervision, uh, that was uh, evenly split, actually. Um, many jurisdictions were looking at recidivism, uh, tracking beginning at the time the youth is placed on community supervision. Some were also looking at it when they were going, when they were discharged from community supervision, and yet there was a number of jurisdictions that did both. In Rhode Island, we actually track both. Uh, the purpose of that is it allows us to evaluate the effectiveness of the community uh, supervision um, that is being provided, the various programs that are being offered to youth and families. Uh, and at the same time, we have the baseline to compare it to our exit cohort uh, for community supervision, youth who are leaving um, probation and seeing what results. So I, my suggestion uh, is I think using um, both time frames for uh, the community-based supervision is, uh, is uh, desirable. In terms of uh, challenges to access the data, well one of the things that we had to talk about was uh, what is the database 
to support the recidivism. We all may have the same measure or close to the same measure, but what data are you accessing to make that determination? Uh, of the 35 jurisdictions, not surprisingly, uh, the results were uh, kind of middle of the road. 14 of the jurisdictions have access to data from their local courts, and that, that's very useful. Uh, that, that should provide them very accurate uh, data to be able to track whether or not a youth who's either left the program or a youth that is under community supervision has recidivated, uh, both in the juvenile and the adult, uh, in the adult courts. 12 have access to law enforcement data. 15 have access to data from other state or local agencies. I can speak from Rhode Island's experience on that one uh, with our Department of Corrections. Actually, our director is here uh, doing the presentation on adult recidivism. We have an interagency agreement that affords us access to their uh, adult database for individuals going into the uh, prison. What we don't have, and it's not a reflection on the director, what we don't have yet is access to the uh, population of youth who leave the juvenile system and go into the adult probation system. And it's not because we can't get it, it's a matter of updating their database to make it retrievable. Uh, but again, access to data is a critical element and is a challenge in terms of trying to implement uh, the standards that are in the white paper. Collection of data. Uh, Ned went into this uh, on the slide presentation. Uh, most of the jurisdictions that measure recidivism collect the uh, following characteristics, the age, ethnicity, sex, uh, community of, uh, committing offenses by degree, uh, race, uh, risk level, placement type. The more measurements to you, quite frankly, can uh, include in the recidivist uh, measurements, the richer the data will be. And I think you saw a classic example of how Maine is able to utilize their data, uh, not only by the race, ethnicity, uh, committing offenses, but also by risk level, uh, placement type. Uh, it's a wonderful tool, actually, uh, to evaluate the success of your uh, services you're providing in the facility, as well as the uh, services throughout in the community. So uh, this is, even though it's a negative measure, it's also a program uh, evaluation measure. All right, this was the slide I thought I was going to. Uh, tracking recidivism, as you can see, 22 of the 35 jurisdictions track recidivism uh, for up to three years. Uh, 12 of the jurisdictions currently track for two years or less. Uh, I could say that as we dig into this data, uh, I think of the 35 jurisdictions that responded, uh, probably uh, 30, uh, 30 of the 35, if not even more, track it for at least the baseline of uh, 24 months. So this is actually very encouraging. Utilization of the recidivism data. Uh, this is really not surprising, but now that you have the data, how do you use it? Uh, well, 35 of the jurisdictions uh, would utilize the recidivism data for internal management planning. Uh, 33, utilize the data uh, in reports to external stakeholders, whether it's court, legislature, uh, state legislature, other uh, state municipal agencies. Uh, 31, use the data to provide feedback to facility and or program staff. And that's a key one, uh, because the ability to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of your programs, I can't say it enough, and being able to have objective baseline data is critical. Uh, and the others, uh, and again, there's a, there's a pretty good uh, representative uh, portion of the 35 uh, jurisdictions that measure recidivism. 26 use the recidivism data to evaluate the effectiveness of programs. 24 use the recidivism data to support grant applications. And 21 of the jurisdictions use the uh, recidivism data to support program budgets. Every year, we, and Ned alluded to this, every year you go to the General Assembly and at budget time you're asked, what is your recidivism data? And uh, at least in Rhode Island, before we were giving numbers, and those numbers could have been pulled out of our cardboard box, quite frankly. Uh, once we uh, implemented this, uh, we were able to provide a number that is far more uh, objective and has some substance to it 
Not that the General Assembly will appreciate it because they'll keep coming back with, well, what about the state that has 9%? Oz is 23% for the first year. Uh, but again, you had to try to suggest that you, you, you're really comparing apples and oranges in terms of what the measures are about. And the one thing this survey has done, it's really identified that we still have, it's very complex uh, discussion, and we still have many challenges to go in terms of trying to group uh, the various jurisdictions, because you really can't compare. And this isn't about trying to one-up uh, the other jurisdiction. It's about trying to group uh, the jurisdictions that do measure recidivism in the same way uh, and at least have some comparative baseline to be able to uh, work off of. It's not one jurisdiction is better than the other. This can actually be utilized very positively both internally and externally with our stakeholders. Uh, next steps for the uh, committee. Well, the committee will get this presentation that you're seeing today, next week. Uh, we're going to analyze the results. We're actually going to go into the jurisdictions that, that responded and try to group them uh, in terms of commonality. Uh, provide definition of core uh, recidivism values and terms. That's a key one because we can all talk about re-adjudication, but we all have to have the same understanding of what that word means. Okay, we, we, uh, from a law school point of view, I'm sure everyone would be able to articulate a definition for re-adjudication. But in practice, what does it really mean? Uh, and what are you actually, uh, what is included in your uh, re-adjudication definition in terms of the population you're measuring? Uh, we will collect the data once we uh, can group the jurisdictions. We want to collect the data from the member jurisdictions. Uh, we'll correlate that data by the common measurements and identify commonality of practices consistent with the CJCA white paper. I'm hoping that at the uh, summer meeting for the CJCA, we'll at least have a first uh, run at uh, grouping the data and presenting it to the member jurisdictions at that time. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, otherwise I'll turn it over to Melody. Okay. Before I want to introduce you. Okay. All right. Um, just before I introduce Melody, I just want to see if there are any comments or, or questions, whether you, whether you think we're on the right track with this um, ambitious project we've had now for three years. You'll see how hard it is to get common definitions. But I think what one of uh, Kevin's last statements was very important. If you go to the legislature and they're pulling a number that they've heard about a jurisdiction that claims a 9% recidivism rate, but they're using a different measurement standard, you really, and it's very hard in a legislative hearing to say, well, you, well uh, Mr. Senator, <laughs> this is really what's going on over there. So that's why we're really trying to get the states to come to a common definition. And by the way, the, the white paper is on our, um, our website, cjca.net if you want to take a look at the white paper. When I was the commissioner of um, the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, the National Council of Crime and Delinquency studied our recidivism rate and they compared us with like cohorts in other states. And they found that we had, and I'm doing this from 20 years ago, uh, let's say we had, I think, a 52% re-arrest rate. And this was considered a model system with the small programs, with the intensive uh, treatment, uh, good staff to youth ratios. So we had a 52% re-arrest, and I think it was in the first 12 months, um, or maybe it was the first two years. Then there was like a 30% uh, re-adjudication or conviction, and there was a 23% recommitment to juvenile or commitment to adult. So it was a very important to have those three measures, not just the re-arrest rate. I know one secretary in one state, when I was doing some work with their state, they were under a consent decree, and um, I said, how do you measure recidivism? He said, I'm measuring it by arrest. I said, you're hanging yourself by measuring by arrest because um, a lot of these kids are the likely suspects when they go back into the community. And you really need to have the other two measures to, to, to give an accurate picture of what your recidivism rate is. So, so I, I doubt it's in the legislation, but I just don't know. Well, the, the whole purpose of, of doing recidivism measurement of both criminal uh, criminal offenses and, and technical violations is to really improve upon your approaches. I mean, one of the things I mentioned early on is if, if you are doing a recidivism study on an individual program um, and you find out that the program is not effective, then that's a budgeting decision for you, um, a programmatic and a budgeting decision. You may be pouring good money after bad. I think one of the 
I, think, I don't think it's based on um, recidivism measures, but um, they, they, well, it is based on recidivism measures. There's a high rate of recidivism of kids leaving um, secure confinement and not having reintegration programs to go back into the community. And so there's a real trend toward reentry. I mean, th this whole conference is about reentry. Your grants are about reentry. And so there much more money is being spent now on that reentry phase. Um, that's what did distinguish Massachusetts 20 years ago from a lot of the other programs around the country because we no longer had the large training schools. We had small, secure treatment programs, but that was just one program, and only 15% of the kid went into the, those programs in the first place. But that was just one of the stepping stones. Kids left there, went into a group home. Kids left went, uh, from the group home, went home with what we called outreach and tracking, which was a private tracker who had, was not bound by union rules and so was, was available for the kid uh, in the evenings and on weekends. And then they had a case manager, who, who only, a, a state case manager, who only had 21 cases on the caseload. Uh, so therefore, those are policy implications that you get from measuring the results of either individual approaches, such as kids placed on probation, kids placed in secure care, um, uh, or kids um, placed in community-based care, which are, I think, critically important. I want to leave time for Melody, so are there any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, do you think, I mean, you all, many, most of you did raise your hand um, that you are doing recidivism. Does this approach that we're trying to uh, encourage uh, this, and I, I presume you're somehow associated with state, but not necessarily some of you are with county systems. Um, do people think that this is worth the effort that we're taking? We're a little further, um, we're more advanced in the measurements of recidivism, but as Kevin's data pointed out, we, we still need to go, we need to get 10 more to, to answer the surveys, or, send, or 12 more to send in the survey responses, and we'd use SurveyMonkey and make it pretty easy for them. Um, but um, states are still measuring it differently and not collecting the same information. Again, it is a resource issue. When I showed those circles, as we have those three levels, that last level is, is fairly expensive to do. And so again, but the more we can, we can make the case to legislatures and the judiciary, the more support they're going to be, there is going to be to, to fund the kind of research that needs to be done for, um, for our juvenile correctional system. So with that, I'd like to, um, to introduce Melody Haynes, who is the acting uh, administrator at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, at, in 2009, President Obama had uh, appointed her as the assistant acting administrator for policy, uh, and she served in that position until she was appointed in, uh, in January of this year. Um, Me Melody, her bio is in your uh, book, and I can hardly read the print, but I know she's worked at the county level in, uh, as either an assistant, uh, a deputy attorney or attorney at the county level in Montana and, um, and Iowa, and she's prosecuted um, child abuse cases, criminal cases, uh, the gamut. She's got a 30-year um, career in law and services uh, in the community. And so uh, we're really delighted to have Mel here this afternoon. She had a, a previous event, and she wanted to make, make, it, um, make it here to see all of you and to share some of her uh, vision and her um, current programs at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So I'm pleased to introduce Mel Melody Haynes, who likes to be called Mel. <laughs> You're welcome, Mel. Thanks, Ned. And when he said I've been doing this for 30 years, it's because I was five okay. when I started. <laughs> it was in your bio. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Uh, so, hi. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I do apologize that I was late. I came directly from our National Missing Children's Day ceremony at the Justice Department, and that's where we honor the people who work hard every single day to return missing children. Uh, and then, if that wasn't enough, this morning I testified before a United States Senate uh, Judiciary Subcommittee, and I mention that because it's certainly relevant to some of your points, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So where there's a will, there's a way to get here. Um, 
Uh, this plenary actually was something that I had specifically asked Mike Thompson and others at the Council on State Governments to participate in because the issue of measuring and reducing recidivism is so important. I know that Ned and Kevin have been talking to you about the importance of collecting accurate and meaningful data and the challenges that we all face in defining and measuring recidivism as you were just describing. We all know what the problem is. There are no national statistics on juvenile recidivism and no widely accepted standards for how data should be collected. This means that reported recidivism rates are not necessarily comparable across uh, states or programs, just as Kevin and Ned have been discussing. So we are very pleased that OJJDP was able to support the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators work in this area. The standards that CJCA developed help us move in the direction of providing what I like to call good data that can stand up to close examination and that can be used to compare individual programs, types of programs, and correctional agencies. So thank you very much, CJCA. I just want to give you a word about OJJDP uh, while I have your ear for a second. Our priority for kids is to prevent whenever possible first the onset of delinquent behavior, prevention. That's in our, our name, juvenile justice and delinquency prevention. But second, um, we want to prevent, once they have had contact with the system, from coming back into it. That being said, once these people appear on the doorsteps of juvenile justice through arrest or, or referral and enter juvenile residential facilities, our priority is to do what Ever we can to help these kids get back on track and to prevent them from ever going through the doors of the system again. That means, among other things, they really need comprehensive reentry planning and the appropriate supports and services once they go back home and back into their communities. And who's going to be the primary support for these kids once they're released? Maybe. Maybe I'm too close. Uh, maybe it's a biological parent, an aunt, an uncle, or a favorite coach, or a mentor. These are a young person's family. Whether that family is biological or not, it really doesn't matter. It's those consistent and caring personal connections that so often make the difference in helping kids recover and helping them get back on track. And that's one reason why at OJJDP, we are really emphasizing the importance of families at every stage of juvenile justice, and that includes reentry planning. Um, we have learned that families connecting with kids in the system makes a world of difference as to how they do and what the outcomes are. That's just one part of reentry, however, and it's something near and dear to our heart at OJJDP, and it's something that the juvenile justice system seems to be focusing on more and more. As everyone knows, one major way we are trying to make reentry successful is through the Second Chance Act, and we've partnered with Justice Department's Bureau of Justice Assistance and the National Institute of, of Justice on implementing the Second Chance Act by focusing on juvenile reentry. Through the Second Chance Act, we're offering a whole range of services, mentoring, mental health counseling, substance abuse treatment, employment assistance, and other services that can help young people transition from that incarceration point to getting back into the community. And we are so fortunate to be able to benefit from the Bureau of Justice Assistance's National Reentry Resource Center. Their dedicated staff provide assistance and resources to help make our programs as successful as they can be. And all of us in the juvenile justice field are so lucky to have the leadership and the guidance of the Resource Center's Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee, led by experts like Shay Bilchek, who is legendary, obviously, in our office, and Dave Altshuler. They are both so knowledgeable and so committed to this. 
One of the projects that we're working on with NIJ, National Institute of Justice, is to evaluate five juvenile reentry programs. Our goal is to find out the impact of these programs, how they're affecting rearrests and delinquency adjudications, and whether they're reducing violations of, of supervised release, and whether or not, importantly, are they cost effective. We hope this gives us valuable new insight into what works. But we have a lot of other initiatives at OJJDP that touch on reentry. Our formula grant funding, juvenile accountability block grants, our tribal reentry, just to cite a few. And in deciding whether we're achieving the desired outcomes, of course, we look at whether kids show improvements in their behavior, mental health, social interactions, academic achievement, and other aspects of their life. But everyone in this room knows, at the end of the day, the ultimate proof of success is whether kids are able to break the cycle that keeps them from landing back in the juvenile justice system. So accurately measuring our success, we need to accurately measure recidivism. We're in a whole new world and a whole new environment, and we are all learning to do much more with less. From the day I walked in OJJDP, our budget has been cut 55-0%, and I've only been here three years. We have had to forge new partnerships. We've had to get creative about how we do those partnerships, and Ned is, is living proof CJCA is a partner of ours. Uh, with the National Center for Youth in Custody and has done fabulous work with that. But we really have had to get creative about getting the biggest bang for the buck that we can because they are so compromised. These days, especially on Capitol Hill, the questions are coming fast and furious. And uh, trust me, I got quite a few this morning. Senator Grassley, in our discussion about our programming for investigation and prosecution of child abuse cases, first question out of the chute. You have listed over 40 programs that somehow provide this kind of training. How do you know they work? How do you know what you're doing works? How can you tell the taxpayers that this is a good investment? It's all about the science. It's all about evaluation, and I assured him, and I have a feeling he will hold my feet to the fire, that that's our mantra at the Department of Justice, is to invest in programs that work, and that's why the work on recidivism is so critical, so we can finally be able to articulate this is not only the right thing morally to do for these kids, but on the, on the, at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do with your resources. Now, some are a little more interested in the resources and the cost than the right thing to do, but as long as we achieve the same goal, and that is to have much better outcomes for these kids that get into the system. That's what all of us do every day and are doing with these reentry programs, and I thank you for the work that you're doing. And I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about OJJDP's programs and priorities. And please know that we will continue to do everything in our power that we can to support your important work. Thank you. Sure, I'll take questions. You know what I meant to do, too? If I can divert for a second, I was going to tell a little anecdote about um, a reentry program that I visited about a month ago in Illinois, Redeploy Illinois. Really, it's really kids that are in the system, they've been adjudicated, um, they've been adjudicated as delinquents, and it is the last chance, Texaco, for these kids before they go to the training school. And I, I went, I was invited to go to meet some of the kids and to see the successes of this program, and it's really a community based, multidisciplinary you know, comprehensive program for kids short of sending them into a car incarceration. I was so impressed. They do everything for these kids, say mental health services, substance abuse, education. And so I met four of the kids, and one of them, his name was Andrew. 
And Andrew stood up and was so articulate and admitted, you know what, I was on my way. And if it wasn't for this opportunity, I would have gone down that path. He w had been charged with arson, with burglary, and it was all substance abuse related. And, and so he finally got the treatment. His parents were there. You know, it was a remarkable story. Here's what's even more remarkable. I'm not kidding. Five minutes after I landed back in Washington, D.C., I had an email from Andrew. He got my email address, and the email was, I'm interested in internship opportunities. Can I, could you tell me what OJJDP has? And you know what? what? I mean, that is a success story. And so I turned it around, and I, I said to our staff, we got to start walking the talk. Let's start an internship program for some of these kids who are successful and give them an opportunity. So that's my anecdote. I am happy to take any questions. We have Tom Murphy here and Linda Rosen, who are way smarter than I am about this stuff, so I may rely on them too. You know, interestingly, one of the statistics that I gave to Senator Grassley and Klobuchar and Franken this morning was that part of our goal at OJJDP is keeping kids out to begin with, not even letting them get there. Um, but once a child is adjudicated, abused, or neglected, 55% of them get arrested as juveniles. And that's so interesting, it correlates with that 60% number that you just cited. I think we ended up with about 262 million. That's, that's nuts to soup. That is everything we do at OJJDP. And I have to tell you, we are the only place you're gonna see the words juvenile justice at the Department of Justice. We're it. We are the only place that has the backs of kids that go in the system. And that's, when you compare it to other budgets, oh, don't get me started, it is paltry compared to others. No, 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 no. BJA is a standalone and NIJ is standalone. It's just for all things juvenile justice. Well, thank you all.